It was highly collaborative in the sense that this was a group of, you know, make up a number of 30-ish people who were all interested in much the same kinds of things, although with tentacles off into, you know, theoretical computer science, math, and so on, uh, physical sciences kind of thing. But mostly, a lot of us at least, were, were basically software people. Bjarne came to uh, Bell Labs, I think, in 1979, after getting his PhD at Cambridge. Um, and he was interested in simulation, you know, he'd uh, known uh, Simula in particular, which was uh, an object, probably one of the very first object-oriented languages. And he wanted to do simulation, but C was kind of the language that people used at Bell Labs. And so what he did was to try and take some of the good ideas from Simula, in particular class ideas, and put that on top of C. And for a long time, the implementation of C++ was basically translate C++ into C, and then you could run it anywhere. So it's one of many pragmatic engineering decisions that Bjarne made that if you want, it's hard to get people to buy into a new language if they have to carry an enormous amount of infrastructure and support and other baggage with it. Whereas if it's one more program that then fits perfectly into your existing environment as a language, as libraries, and all the rest of it, much easier. And so C went through a period of evolution. Well, it's still evolving. Uh, but starting there in the very early you know, 1980, 81, something like that, the two languages were very much together because we're all in this one group in Bell Labs that would fit comfortably in this corridor, this building. Um, and Bjarne was certainly knew C inside out and then was developing this new language that ran on top of it that stressed C compilers, so that was useful because the code that, that his preprocessor generated was astonishing. Oh. And I think some of the ideas in C++ then retrofitted back into C, in particular the obvious one of how you declare the arguments for a function. I mean, that's just, that was better. Yeah and a handful of other things. So for a while, the two languages, you could say that C was a pretty close to perfect subset of C++. Uh, I think that's e evolved in both directions, and so it's less true now than it was. But for a long time, you could take a C program and just run it through a C++ compiler, and it would work. Be be there's a general observation that it, people write code differently than computers write code. And so machine-generated code tends to stress in particular, the compiler or the language for which you're generating. And, and so in the C++ to C example, they were, you know, incredibly deeply nested constructs of one sort or another, you know, parentheses that made Lisp look tame, um, and then very convoluted pointer con kinds of computations as well, function pointers, all kinds of... And so it was definitely a stress test. And also generating things that had odd sizes and, and so on that were not expected, or at least paths that had maybe not been thoroughly tested in a given compiler. So it was a stress test for C compilers. I think a lot of people did not think that C++ was right in some sense. It had various warts, blemishes, and so on. Many of those were, again, a direct result of Bjarne's engineering judgment. If you want this thing to take off, the more culturally compatible it is, the more likely it will do that. If you make something that's wildly different, people are going to kind of ignore you. And so, um, and so some of the syntactic problems of C++ that are still with us are, you know, the same syntactic problems that you see in C. For quite a while, when I was trying to teach C++ to people, I would show them the translation that goes from a C++ object into C. And, you know, it's basically just pointers into structures with the compiler kind of keeping the names apart so you don't have to think about them. And, and seeing that translation, you could see how object-oriented programming could be done at essentially no overhead because it's just structure pointers and, um, and funny function names, and you can pass function pointers around. And, yeah. So it was all 
pretty well behaved. And I think that understand, I mean, it helped me understand what was going on in C++ and object-oriented programming and so on. I think in modern languages, in Python, a, a fine example of that, there's an incredible amount of magic going on there. And I don't quite know how it's done as well as it is. I mean, I can sort of imagine, but, but the mechanisms to make some of those things, list comprehensions with lambdas in them and so on, as well, how the heck does that work? <laughs>